Greetings, friends and colleagues. It's Sean Elvis. This is a response video for Thomas Lundy. Um, he had produced a video uh, a week or so ago, basically saying that you have to believe in Jesus and do God's will in order to inherit salvation. Now, I don't want to get too hung up on words here, but basically I'll say this. I do not believe that salvation is inheritance. Um, I think it I think of it more as a gift, okay? You you see an inheritance is something you receive after somebody passes away, right? Like uh, a parent dies or both your parents or your grandparents die and the inheritance is passed on. Um and I know that there are stories in the Bible that talk about uh, obtaining inheritance before um, a parent dies. Um, so that's why I don't want to get hung up on words. But ultimately, I, uh, the point I'm trying to make is um, I don't see it as we are inheriting salvation, but rather salvation is a free gift. It's a gift. You know, I'm saved right now. Um, and that's a past tense term, saved. I'm, I'm not going to be saved in the future. Um I'm not being saved right now. I have been saved in the past, right? I've been saved for many years now. And, you know, I'll continue to be saved until the day I die and on for all eternity. You know, in fact, the moment that I got sealed and I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, my name was written in the book of life. And, and you know, nothing can take my name out of that book. So that's why I'm saved which allows me to inherit everlasting life. But anyway, <laughs> I digress, right? It's a, it's a word game. Um, so anyway, I watched Thomas's video. I watched your video, and I tried to explain to you how and why in the comment section that your doctrine was, that your doctrine was wrong. And you, you know, because you took the position that, you know, a person has to believe in Jesus and follow his commandments in order to be saved. Whereas, you know, I take the position that a person only needs to be, only needs to put their faith in Jesus alone for salvation. Now, you rejected that doctrine that I taught on grounds, um, on the grounds that something to the effect of, uh, well, you're preaching that you don't have to obey God's will. Okay? Which is true and false, depending on what you mean by obeying God's will, you know? And, you know, I, I think it's more false for reasons that I don't think you fully understand, you know, and, and, I, and I'm not saying that you're ignorant or I'm not saying that you're stupid and you can't understand. I'm saying maybe you haven't heard it this way or you know, we explain it to you. Hence why I'm making this video for you. You know, I, I posed the question back to you after that and I asked you, Thomas, uh, please explain um, why Jesus died for our sins he came and died for the sins of the whole world he came here and died if all we have to do is have faith and obey the commandments you know why would jesus even come and you replied with uh, three short scriptures three verses out of the bible without explaining it at all and which i asked you a second time i asked you I said, you know, thank you for those verses. I appreciate those verses, but I've read those verses out of the Bible. I read the Bible. I've read them several times. I, I, what I was asking is for you to explain those things. I wanted you to explain them to me. Um, then you re replied back with something to the effect of, well, those verses are self-explanatory. So then I um, basically... <laughs> I basically accused you of dodging the question because you didn't explain it. And when I gave you another chance to explain it, you still didn't explain it. So um, then you replied back to me and asked me <laughs> to explain the verses for you. So here we are. And mind you, I'm only doing this video because I genuinely care about you. You know, I think you're a very smart man. I've been watching your videos for the past six, almost seven months, maybe. And I enjoy them. They're very good. I learn something. I get entertained, and and um, I like the uh, your countenance of your character. It's very it's very uh, well mannered and honest. And so, 
you know, for you to put out a video and basically call me a satanic prophet or whatever, you know, I, uh, that's not true, man. I'm, I'm, I just want you to have the truth. I, I want all of us to come to the understanding of the truth of our Lord and Savior, because we both believe this book. We both believe the Bible, you know, so here we go. Let's go. Um, first, I'll read the three scriptures that you sent me. Then I'll go back and I'll go through them and then I'll explain them. So the first one you sent me is um, John chapter 3, verse 17 that says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that, um, sorry, but that the world through him might be saved. And remember, the question I asked you is, please explain to me that if you, if all you have to do is um, believe in God and and obey the commandments, why did Jesus come? And you and you said, well, John three seventeen says, for God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but through the world Him might be saved. Okay, so we agree that Jesus came to save us. We'll we'll read these first. Okay, John fifteen ten four, through fourteen. Is your second verse. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down on his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatever I command you. And the third verse you gave is First uh, John, Chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the, Christ, is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that beget loveth him, and, any, and everyone that loveth him that beget loveth him also that is begotten of him. I might have copied that wrong. But by this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Okay, so keeping in mind that the question I asked you is, explain to me why Jesus had to come and, and die for our sins, the sins of the whole world, if, if uh, all we have to do is believe in God and follow His commandments. So, um, for your first verse, John three seventeen, which says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We can easily see from this verse that Jesus was sent to save the world. I don't think either of us are arguing on that point. Christ literally means Messiah. The word Christ just means Messiah or, or Savior. Okay, So I, I want you to notice the past tense of the word saved in this verse. That might be saved. Past tense. We're not being saved. We're not trying to get saved. Once you believe on Jesus, you're saved. Um, what's he saving us from? You know, he's saving us from the second death. You know, Revelation chapter 20, I think. Um, he's saving us from hell, eternal punishment in the lake of fire. That is what we are being saved from. So Jesus came to save us from that. Um, you know, you say, you say, Sean, how does that work? You see, Jesus lived a perfect life. Okay, he never sinned, never once sinned. Now we, um, humans, everybody else uh, who was born of a man or born of a woman, is a sinner. You know, I don't think you and I disagree there. And if we die in our sins without believing in him, we won't be saved. We're going to go to hell when we die. In other words, because Jesus was innocent, right? Because he kept the whole law. You know, he never once broke a commandment. Or, you know, as you would put it, because he followed the perfect will of God 100% of the time. See, you and me, we can't follow the perfect will of God 100% of the time. Some days we might do better than other days, but... We're going to sin. Uh, even after we believe in Jesus, we're still going to sin. Now, he was able to take our sins upon himself and pay for our punishment that we deserve for us. You know, he sacrificed himself for us. 
basically, he didn't come here pointing fingers at us saying, you you bunch of sinners, you guys are all going to be judged. No, he, he didn't come to judge us for how sinful we are. He came to save us from the sins that we are already doomed to be punished for, okay? There's so much more I can say about this verse, um, but that I can go on for, for a long time. That could be a whole video. So let's check out your second verse. John 15, verses 10 through 14 says, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Okay, so he's not talking about salvation. This verse is not talking about salvation. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. So he wants us to have joy inside of us. And that your joy might be full. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this than a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So I didn't see anything in that whole section about salvation. This verse is not talking about salvation or these series of verses. It's talking about how we can have a relationship with God. If we obey God's commandments and we follow in the steps of Jesus and, and, and love others as He has loved us, then we can have joy in our hearts and peace in our lives, peace in our own hearts, you know, and peace with our fellow brothers and our fellow sisters, um, and just peace in general with everybody around us, and ultimately peace with God, you know, um, you know through the example that Jesus showed us when he lived his perfect life and he showed us um, how to perfect our love for one another. And how did he show us perfect love? You know, even though peop um, we, people, were nailing him to the cross, killing him without causing any sin. You know, he had no sin and no reason to be nailed to the cross, but we still did it. And he still loved us and prayed for us. And he showed us how to be like him, okay? He showed us that God loves us, you know, not even uh, to the bitter end of his life when he took his last breath. He never gave up on any of us, did he? In fact, the thief on the cross, right next to him, I think on the left or, I don't remember, either on the left or the right, it doesn't really matter, but the thief on the cross next to Jesus said to Jesus, he said, remember me when you come into my kingdom. And in that moment, the thief on the cross, he put his faith on Jesus. He put his faith on Jesus Christ and he saved him. How do we know that? Because what did Jesus reply to him? He said, today you're going to be in paradise with me. You know, that thief didn't have time to do any works. Okay, He didn't have time to do the will of God or, or he didn't even have time to, to desire to do the will of God. I mean, he was hanging to a cross. He was in his last moments. You know, if you think that we're saved by doing good works or, or, or doing the will of God, as you put it, or, or even desiring to do the will of God, you know, it's difficult to argue how the thief on the cross was uh, going to be, I mean, he was going to be dead in the next few hours, right? So, I mean, was he really thinking, oh man, I really have a desire to uh, do the will of God? <laughs> um, I, um Oh um, no, I, I think uh, the last breaths that he took um, were probably in agony and, and maybe even, maybe he was sorry for what he did um, and he was repenting, but nevertheless, you know, what did Jesus say to him? He said in Luke chapter 23 verse 43, he said, today shall thou be with me in paradise, you know, he got saved from that moment forward. From the moment he looked at Jesus and, and put his faith on Jesus, Jesus turned to him and said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. He got saved in that moment. You know, in the moment of the twinkling of an eye, the Holy Spirit entered him and he was saved. You know, his name was written in the book of life because he put on his faith on Jesus to save him. Okay, he called upon the name of the Lord and he confessed with his mouth and believed in his heart. And Jesus said, you're saved. You know, I know this is pre-resurrection um, and all that stuff. So, Holy Spirit didn't probably enter him and all that stuff. But nevertheless, Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. You know, he, he could have spent his last moments 
I believe, cursing everybody around him, you know. But it wouldn't have mattered because Jesus had already spoken. He said, you're already saved, okay. You know, no matter what he did after that point in his last moments, he was going to paradise because Jesus said it. And you know, the moment I put my faith, or the moment you put your faith on Jesus Christ 100% to save you, your name is going to get written in the book of life. And, and, and my name is there right now, you know. So I have a choice. I have a choice now. I can do God's will, or I can not do God's will. But either way, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven because I have already put my faith on Jesus Christ to take me there. I already know He's going to take me there. Now, let's continue to your third verse so I don't take up too much time here. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1-4 through 4 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him, begat loveth him also, that is begotten of him. Remember, Jesus said, you can't get into the kingdom unless you're born again. Remember that? Well, how do you get born again? Well, you put your faith on Jesus. You believe 100%, like no doubt in your heart, that Jesus died for all your sins when he was on that cross. That all the sins were put on Jesus on that cross. They were all nailed to the cross, including the sin of not desiring to do the commandments, right? I have, maybe you had no desire to change your life around, but you just believed that Jesus was going to die for your sins anyway. The past sins that you've committed, the present sins you committed, and the future sins that you will commit throughout your life, you know, once you do that, once you put all your faith on Jesus, that he died for every sin, your name is written in the book of life and you get born again. The Holy Spirit enters you and indwells you and you become a son of God. Now, unfortunately, you know, I didn't write a, a scripture backing that up in my notes, but anyway, you also have to believe Jesus Christ is the son of God or excuse me. You also have to believe Jesus is the Christ. Christ meaning Savior, right? Son of God. He has the power to take away your sins because he's without sin, right? Verse 2 says, But um, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Look, all this is saying is, is that you have a choice. You know, after you get saved, you can choose to love your brother keep the commandments, or you can choose to hate your brother and you can choose to disobey the commandments, you know? You see, God gives us free will. God's not a tyrant. He's not going to force us to do anything. You see, the government that we're under, they don't give us a choice. You know, we either obey their laws or they punish us. There's no two ways about it. But that's not to say that God doesn't spank us, you know, when we mess up. But God can never back out of His promise. You know, He promised us everlasting life. You know, once we put our faith on Him, once we call upon the name of the Lord Jesus to save us, our name is written in that book of life, and eternal life is ours forever, you know, no matter what we do after that. And we then have a choice. Obey God's commandments? Don't obey God's commandments. Either way, eternal life is ours. Um... You know, that's what makes God so amazing because, you know, he, he gives us free will. You know, he gives us free will. Now, when we disobey his commandments, it's going to destroy our lives. You know, that's what sin does. Sin destroys our lives. Sin bringeth forth death because sin is destructive to our flesh. But our spirit can't be damaged anymore because, remember, once we put our faith on Jesus, the Holy Spirit entered us and we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. And, you know, our, so our flesh, our flesh will still sin, but the spirit inside of us is the spirit of Christ, the spirit of God. And when God, God the Father, sees us, all he sees is perfection. Just like in the Old Testament, the Passover, remember the Passover? When, when they applied the blood to the doorstep or the doorpost or whatever, you know, their house, that house would be saved 
from the wrath of God. You know, when the firstborn children were getting killed. Well, in that same way, in the New Testament, when we put our faith on the precious blood of Jesus Christ, you know, the sacrificial sacrificial lamb, lamb of God, you know, God passes over us, okay? You know, He views us as if we have no sin. You know, our names are written in the book of life. Verse number four. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now, I don't know why you stop there, because if you keep reading in verse 5, um, it explains how to overcome the world. It says, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? You see, all we have to do is believe. John 3.16 says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Um, Acts 16.31 says, What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that sh- and thou shalt be saved. Ephesians chapter 2 says, For by grace are we saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, we're saved by faith, not of works. Romans 3.31 says, and, and this is your main objection, uh, Thomas. Do we make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So, you see, when we read the first few chapters of Romans, uh, Paul lays out all the evidence against everybody. You know, Paul clearly explains to everybody, hey, we are all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. No, nobody on earth is, is, is above sinning, whether you're saved or not saved, you know. But, but he says, you know, nobody, nobody's without sin. And, and until you put your faith on the blood of Jesus, which is a propitiation for our sins, meaning Jesus Christ takes our sin upon him, our sin, we put it on him, you know, you're not saved, you know, but the moment you do place your faith on him, you're saved forever, you know, you, you can't lose it because it's everlasting, it's eternal, you know, this, and then you say, well, does that mean we shouldn't obey the commandments anymore, Sean? Does that mean we just throw out this book and throw out the law and, and, and the commandments became nothing? No, no, no. God forbid. God forbid we throw the commandments out. No, we should obey God's commandments as much as possible. As much as we possibly can, we should obey the commandments. But, you know, God realizes that that takes work. You know, God God doesn't... And, and you know, God doesn't make us earn our salvation. Okay, it's a free gift. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Now, think about think about this, okay? Do I have to do something for a gift? You know, if 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 I were gonna give you a dollar, Thomas, if I were gonna give you this dollar as a gift, and and you know, if I came to give you this as a gift, and I said, "Here's your gift, Thomas. Here's your dollar bill," but if you you have to call me awesome you have to call me mr mr awesome mr amazing all the time and, and if you don't do that all the time i'm gonna take this dollar back for you and put it back in my pocket right you know that's that's not a gift right all, all you have to do for a gift is just take it and receive it and say thanks bro you know it, you know it's it, no gift hold on my notes are confusing. Right. See, yeah, if I give you a gift, a real gift, you know, all you do is accept it and say, well, thanks, bro. You know, that was really nice of you. And I say, yeah, well, yeah, I just, I give you that gift because I love you, you know. And you say, oh, you really shouldn't have. And I say, well, I did because I love you, you know. And, and you know, Roman, according to Romans 6.23, what is this gift that God, that God has for us, you know. Romans 6.23, but the wages of sin is gift. But the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I mean, if your gift is eternal life, how many times do you have to receive it? Just one time, right? He can't take that away. It's eternal. It lasts forever. You know, Titus chapter uh, 1 verse 2 says, "In In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began 
You see, he promised us a gift of eternal life. And remember, do we have to, if we have to do something, you know, you always talk about, you have to do this, you have to do God's will. If we have to do something, is it really a gift? See, I think that your doctrine that you're teaching people that you have to do something, that you have to do God's will for salvation, it's not a gift. Um, it's not grace, you know. Um, if you have to do something for salvation, you don't understand that salvation's a gift, okay? It's a gracious gift at that, you know, that it's a gift that we didn't even deserve, right? We actually deserve hell, but we got the gift of heaven. How amazing. Yeah, for the wages of sin is death. We earned with our sin, our wages should be death and hell. But our gift, eternal life. Anyway, I'm, I'm beating this dead horse, so let's move it on. So we have, to, so do we have to do the will of God? Do we have to obey the commandments? Sean says, absolutely, absolutely. But not to be saved, not to go to heaven. That's a free gift. There's a difference there, you see? Let me explain it this way. In Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7, verse 41, um, there, uh, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. One of them owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. And Jesus said, Tell me therefore, which of them will love, will love him much? will love him most and the pharisee answered and said well i suppose he whom he forgave the most and jesus said to him thou hast rightly judged you know if, if you read farther down in the in the chapter jesus eventually forgives the woman for all her sins right now let me ask you a question let's say i die and um i go to heaven and i and i stand before god and, and i say lord um thank you so much for uh saving me and bringing me to heaven thank you so much and and you know i meet the lord jesus and i say thank you jesus thank you for dying for all my sins really appreciate it you know there's nothing that i could have done in my life to get to heaven nothing i, I was destined to go to hell but here but here but here i am you know not on my own account but on your account what you did for me you know is everything that you did for me jesus thank you so much all the credit all the glory and honor go to you thank you and, and then let's say we take person B who who, who believes um, that they need faith and works. And they die. And they go and stand before the Lord. And they say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for all that you've done for me. Thank you for um, going and dying for the, on the cross and, and, and obeying all the commandments. Thank you so much. Um, but, but also, I would like to remind you, Lord, that I did all these works to get here. You know? I, it, if it wasn't for me obeying the commandments, I wouldn't be here, you know, or if they, or maybe they say something like, Lord, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here unless, unless I had a sincere desire to do the commandments. Whew. Good thing I had the desire, right? Otherwise I wouldn't be here. You know, you know, which, which one of those people sounds like the more humble person, Thomas, which one of those people sounds like, um, they love the, uh, the creditor the most. Which one do you think will love Jesus more? Person A, who gave all the credit and all the honor to Jesus, or person B, who says, well, me and Jesus, we did it together. We were, you know, we were a team. You decide. Let me share with you another story. If you, uh, and then I'll be done, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry, this is a long message. Um, Luke chapter 14, verse 15 through 24 says, oh, I didn't copy that. Let me, let me open up my Bible real quick, sorry. Luke chapter 14. Come on. Okay, Luke chapter 14, verse 15 through 24 says, A certain man had a, uh, had a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one, cons with one consent, began to make an excuse. Uh, the first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go see it. I pray thee, have me excused. 
And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee be, that I may be excused. And another one said, I had married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and showed his lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets, lanes, and the cities, and, and bring hither to the poor, and the maimed, and the and halt, and the blind. And, and the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is still room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go into the highways and hedges, and compel them and come in uh, to come in, to my that 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 my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which are bidden shall taste of my supper. I know I flew through that. I'm trying to go fast here because it's a long message. Um, go back and read it. Um, so um, we see that it's God's will that we all go to heaven, right? The Bible says that. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Second Peter chapter three verse nine. You see, in this parable, heaven is like a feast, okay, and God wants all of us to be there. But but we don't. But we don't all want to go. You, you you see, we want to go our own way. <laughs> we want to go our own way, right? We all have an excuse of why we don't want to obey the commandments today. You know, because because of this or because of that or 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 the other. You know. For whatever reason, we'll come up with some excuse to not do God's will, right? We'll come up with some excuse like, oh, I don't want to go to church because of this. Or I don't want to read my Bible, you know, whatever. And, and God says, well, I don't I don't want my feast to go to waste. I, have, I prepared this great feast for everybody to enjoy. I want to enjoy everybody's company here at the feast. So I want you to go compel people out there to be here in my feast. Because I want my tables filled, right, as much as possible. So when, so when we go out as Christians and we evangelize the world, we, we evangelize the lost, it's our duty to compel them to come, okay, so that they have no excuse. There's no reason that they can give to not show up. So you see, heaven is, 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 is not a black tie dinner party. You know, it, it, if you don't dress in a suit and tie... And look your best, you're not getting in, right? No, no. See, God is loving. He's merciful. He's gracious. He wants everybody to be there. In fact, he says, I don't care how you, you, know, you dress. Just come exactly as you are, right? And, and it gets even better than that, right? You don't even have to find your own way there. God will say, hey, you know what? I'll send, I'll send a chaperone for you. I'll send a helicopter. I'll send a... A private ops and secret service and protect you and make sure that you get here safely you know all you have to do is just rsvp me <laughs> tell me you want to come and you'll be there you know just i want you to enjoy the feast with me that's the whole point that i put this feast on you see the way that you're teaching people i think you're telling them that you know no you have to take a shower you have to put your best clothes on black tie event you know put your tuxedo on whereas the bible teaches that um anybody can come just as they are just put your faith in jesus and let's go you know all you have to do is ask jesus to take you there and believe in your heart that he will and you're there simple as that you know every miracle jesus ever performed in the bible Every single one, you know, the only way that Jesus performed that miracle is if the people asked him and they believed that he could do it, right? Um, Matthew chapter 13, verse 58 says, And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief, you know? The only way that Jesus can't do something, the only way that Jesus can't take you to heaven is because you don't believe he can. That's it. You see... You are like marrying faith and works together as is in one 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 unit, okay? But if you read James chapter two, um, that letter is written to people who are already saved. They already believe in Jesus. They just aren't doing any works. They just aren't obeying the commandments, you know. And, and he's saying, hey, you know, just just because you're saved, shame on you for not going out and getting other people saved, right? Shame on you for uh, for taking uh, God's grace, God's gracious gift for granted you know and not and not showing um showing your um what's the word uh appreciation for that you know you see god's not going to charge anybody admission fees to get into heaven right it's a free gift it's a free gift you know once you believe in jesus everlasting life is yours simple as that it's free you're good to go 
But you know, but but what God is going to do is he's going to reward us for all the work that we do after that. You know, he's going to pay us, you know. In other words, it's, it's like an employer that, you, that who hires you and says, I'm going to give you an instant signing bonus, an instant hiring bonus. If you come to work for me, instantly you get eternal life. And any work you do after that, I'm going to pay you for it. Okay, sounds like a good employer to me. You know, so there's an incentive program built into that to go compel other people to come to you. You know, we're not going to compel anybody to, to uh, believe in Jesus if, if, you know, we're not obeying the commandments and showing them, you know, how great Jesus is, right? You see? Lastly, I'm going to say this, and I'll be done. You have your doctrine. I have my doctrine, okay? Your doctrine says that you have to have faith in Jesus and works. Or as you know, you repackaged it and said, uh, faith and works are one and the same, okay? Um, but even a simple reading of James chapter 2 says, faith without works is dead. Which proves that it's possible to have faith without works. I mean, it's going to be dead, meaning you're not going to um, earn any rewards. You're not going to uh, get anybody else saved. Um, your faith is, 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 um, is just going to get you saved. It's not going to get anybody else saved. James chapter 2, verse 14 says, What doth it profit, brethren? Profit, surplus, rewards. You know, you've already broke even when you got saved. You're going to heaven. You know, you, um, but so now we're, we're looking on profiting. How can we get more out of this? You know, and, and then notice he says, Brethren, talking to people who are already saved, the brothers in Christ. You know, what doth it profit to have faith without works? He's urging us and encouraging us to go to go out there and get more souls saved, to get more people to believe in Jesus. And how are we going to do that? Through our works, through obeying the commandments. Uh, um, and then you have my doctrine on the other side. My doctrine says all you need to do is have faith, just faith alone. All you need to do is confess with your mouth, and believe in your heart that, you know, Jesus is the Son of God and God raised Him from the dead. And he died for your sins and that whole story. And that's the only ticket that you need to get into heaven, you know. You just have to apply Jesus' blood to your doorstep. And any works you do after that is profit, complete profit. Here's the last point I'm going to make and then I'm done. Um, if I'm right, if my doctrine's right, and you're, and, or excuse me, if you're right, if, if your doctrine's true, and you're correct, and you have the right doctrine, I'll be fine. I'm still fine, because I have 100% of my faith in Jesus, and I do works. Okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm covered. I'm covered for your doctrine. But if I'm right, and you're preaching a false gospel, a faith tied into works, as a package deal, God's not going to accept that. Because you didn't put all your faith in Jesus. You didn't put 100% faith in Jesus. You were relying on your faith plus your works. You see? You took Jesus' sacrifice down one notch. You know, you, you said, Jesus, your sacrifice on the cross, that wasn't good enough to get me saved. That was not powerful enough, Jesus. If, if I don't do something too, it's not going to work. Okay? So, in closing, I'm going to say this. Thomas, the only thing we have to do is believe. Believe in Jesus. Works are something we need to do, but not for salvation. John chapter 6 verse 29 says, This is the work of God, that he believeth on him who he hath sent. Thanks for listening. God bless.